All right, welcome everybody. Thank you once again for joining us for another uh, phenomenal panel discussion. I'm very excited that you decided to tune in with us. These are some important conversations that we are having that are going to absolutely benefit the black community. My name is Tian, I am the founder of the Centers for Black Excellence. And we happen to believe that at this moment in history right now, we have an opportunity to do something amazing in our community. This is an opportunity for us to go to another level, to be able to accomplish some of the things that we've been wanting to accomplish. But I also believe that in this moment where we are talking about how others are treating us, this is also a time for us to talk about how we are treating each other. And so these panel discussions every week on Tuesday night are going to dive into some different aspects, parts of the conversation that I believe that we need to have with each other. And I'm so excited today to have some awesome panelists with us today to help us broach the topic this week of the unprotected black woman, the unprotected black woman. And I want to begin today by uh, introducing our panelists. Uh, I've told you a little bit about myself and this organization, but I want you to know uh, who's here with us today. So I'm going to begin uh, with uh, the first of our guests tonight, Ms. Sharilyn Payton. Sharilyn Payton is actually the lead coach and consultant for Payton Place, where she provides coaching and training, um, as well as human and organizational development to visionary community leaders, nonprofit organizations, and minority and woman-owned businesses. She is a certified master coach and has been providing training and workshop facilitation for more than 15 years. Her key clients are those whose missions involve supporting the social, emotional, economic, and physical well-being of the underserved and under-resourced. Every aspect of Sherilyn's work and practice is framed around social, racial, and economic justice. Please join me in welcoming to the panel tonight, Ms. Sherilyn Payton of Payton Place Coaching. Would you grace us with a few opening words tonight? Thank you. I will, I will. Um, so thank you again, Tian, for the invitation and for uh, the opportunity to uh, speak on this particular to topic. Um, one of the things that I would like to, to lift up uh, in this um, panel is the need to even uh, talk about uh, unprotected Black women. I'm going to digress from a thought I had earlier that I, that I wanted to share, and I want to kind of get right to this since we changed the order of things a little bit. Um, I'm going to mention that uh, a few years ago, I used to uh, do community forums about, well, under the heading, Black Women Speak. And it was a community conversation about issues that impacted and shaped and changed and guided the lives of Black women and Black people uh, in the community. And so um, one of the themes of that was Malcolm's, uh, from his speech in 1962, uh, that the most unprotected woman in America is the Black woman, mm -hmm. the most disrespected woman in America is the Black woman, and the most neglected. And with that, what, what I want to lift up in this conversation is the um, why he could be a uh, pro-woman, he could make such a pro-woman kind of guide the thought about how did we get here. Mm -hmm. In that speech, he later addresses women and he says, who taught you to hate yourself, right? Wow. Who taught you to hate your lips and your hips and everything from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you that? Right. And having been a reformed pimp, he knows who taught us that. As wow. Malcolm X became who he, uh, who we began to love and appreciate as an activist and a, and a movement uh, maker in the civil rights movement and so forth and, and a hero of ours. We know that he knows where we learn to hate ourselves. Mm. We also learn to hate ourselves. And I'm not going to reach as far back as, you know, our, our enslavement. But part of it came from the, the majority of our self-hate, men and women who are of African descent, came from that. But I'm talking about in this moment when our bodies... Um, are being abused, mm -hmm. when our minds 
are being abused. And we have no, what we want to say, protection from it because the people that we rely on to advocate and to stand in the gap are often our abusers. Wow. And from, wow. and so I have this statement that I make when I'm talking about uh, women being unprotected, uh, women and girls, it's from the cradle to the grave we've been unprotected in in many spaces. From oh, wow. the moment a girl child is born, she is very likely to become a victim of some sort of misconduct from someone. Mm -hmm. And largely it's from those who we have thought were to be our guardians and protectors. And what I'll, I'll transition with, I don't wanna take too much in my introduction, is we have to then go back and define what this protection even is. Wow. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. Very, very powerful opening statement. I hope you realize tonight's discussion is really gonna be amazing. Next, I wanna introduce our next panelist, uh, the Reverend Dr. Nicole D. Harris. Um, she is a community activist, a pastor at Duryea Memorial Amy Zion Church. Um, she is a womanist. She is fierce about her uh, protection of the depiction of and the treatment of women and in particular black women. And I would love for her to come on right now and grace us with her opening statement. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you to Minister Tion for the opportunity to be with you tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to exploring a lot of different <clears throat> things about the, the topic of the unprotected black woman. Um, so many things come to mind, you know, um, being a black woman and knowing what I've had to, to face, knowing what my sisters have had to face um, and, and still um, we face, right? Uh, tomorrow uh, we will um, have a new president and vice president uh, of, this, of this nation. And um, I'm concerned even for the safety of the vice president elect. I mean, that's how it really is, you know, um, so that uh, even in the highest, in, in one of the highest offices in, in the land, that her protection is still something that is at the forefront of my mind. Um, I want to, uh, um, like um, Sister Payton just said, you know, who taught us certain things about ourselves and who taught not just us, but who taught the people around us that we were not to be valued. I think about that, um, in the movie, um, The Color Purple, uh, when uh, uh, Danny Glover's character, Mr., was uh, insulting Whoopi Goldberg, right? He said, you're black, you're a woman. But who said those were insults? And when did those become insults? And when did that become a weapon against me? So, you know, those are the kind of things I would like to talk about um, tonight. So I hope we will explore those. I'm sure that we will. Um, and I'm just looking forward to the discussion. Wow. Absolutely incredible. Thank you very much. Such powerful opening thoughts. Now to our third panelist tonight. Um, just want to say a few words about her briefly. Her name is uh, Ms. Sharice Scott. She is the CEO and founder of Sister Reach. Uh, Sharice has worked in the reproductive justice movement for 15 years and has led her team to achieve a strong presence regarding their education, policy and advocacy, culture change and harm reduction work for the most valuable Tennesseans, um, most vulnerable Tennesseans, excuse me, please welcome to our panel tonight, uh, our sister Sharice Scott, would you please grace us with your opening words? Good evening. Uh, I am also excited to be on this panel and I appreciate the Centers for Black Excellence uh, for this invitation and opportunity to share from my vantage point and um, which sits you know, at the intersection of so many things um, but I think some things that I would love to talk about uh, tonight and bringing in uh, also uh, a womanist understanding uh, as well as a reproductive justice understanding uh, and even broader out into a human rights understanding um, of the ways that I, that I see, the ways that we have been harmed and uh, weakened. But I also want to lift up our resilience, uh, our power, um, our ability to, to uh, you know, to transcend so many different 
hurdles and, and issues that continue to, to harm us and uh, attempt to stunt our growth, our evolution, our access to abundance. Uh, and so, you know, I really want to, uh, want to leave this conversation with your viewers, um, you know, really trying to wrestle with or accept an idea of what it means to trust Black women. Um, mm. and, and that, that we are the best folks who can speak to the things that are impacting our lives, that are harming our families, that are destroying and decimating our communities. But we are also the answer to those same issues, uh, given the tools and the resources, the trust uh, from every level, whether it be on the fam you know family level uh, to the governmental level. So I'm very excited to be here this evening and uh, and very interested in a conversation that exposes the fact that we are unprotected, uh, but that I also hope will round us out in how we are powerful, resilient, and able to move forward. Wow, absolutely awesome. Listen, with that, I wanna go ahead and get into the discussion. If you are watching live, you can feel free to join in the discussion as well by typing in the comments and we can add your comments to the screen so they can be a part of the discussion. Uh, you're already making an impact, Sharice, with our audience, already cheering you on. Yes, we absolutely are powerful. So here it is. Um, I would like to start our discussion. Each one of you that, that gave your opening statements this morning kind of said something that tiptoed into this question. So I'm going to dive right in. And then you guys feel free to just let the conversation go where it does. I'd like to begin tonight by asking this question. When we say that Black women are unprotected exactly who or what does she need protecting from and who should be doing the protecting who or what the black woman is unprotected we have heard this like you mentioned malcolm x that's one of the more power more popular times that he really dove into the idea that there is no one more unprotected more vulnerable more exposed than the black woman the question is who or what does the black woman need to be protected from and who should be doing the protecting let's talk so uh, i think in in uh, i'm gonna go back to malcolm for just a minute because I think the answer is in the question, right? Mm. America okay. has wronged us in so so many ways, um, but it starts with a community, I think, in identifying. So even what I said about Malcolm being reformed from a uh, former pimp, recognizing the harm he had done and owning it, so he, any perpetrator, first of all, is a person who can also be an advocate. So who, the who is, is varying. That, that's all over the place. We also have a responsibility uh, to ourselves as women. So I would say for me, my first answer is when I don't know my audience and I don't know who's in the room and I don't know who my allies are, I am going to show up for myself first. Wow. Um, so the first line of protection when it's me, but when I'm a girl, when I'm a little person, when I am a, a, a woman in the making, it is going to require that someone who is in my community um, be educated and be aware of my presence and stop invisibilizing women, because that's where a lot of the harm comes is when company comes over and it's a group of men and we send our daughters who just came home from you know, ballet practice to their room because men can't manage themselves. Uh, we make our daughters feel like they've done something wrong. Uh, oh, wow. Even being in the room, go, go, baby, go, go put some clothes on or baby, go, you know, and so we, we, we treat this um, as if it is a matter for us to be responsible for, even when we don't have the capacity. So, Sharon, that was a powerful example that you just gave. And, and as a man sitting here listening, as a black man, I'm thinking to myself, I'm the father. Uh, I have a little girl. I have a daughter. And, and as I'm listening to this conversation, I thought to myself, well, yeah, if my daughter just came home from ballet practice and is still wearing the tights and the tutu and some male friends came over, I actually would hurry my daughter out of the room 
to go to her room because, interestingly enough, I don't trust men. And and but I'm now hearing from you that while my mind is on the men that I don't trust, there's something I'm actually doing to my daughter that I hadn't even realized I was doing. And that's we protect the male gaze. We don't protect the child so much as we we don't want men to be uncomfortable with what they're looking at. Instead of saying what God says, you set a watch over your eyes. You are in control of how you look upon a child and how you sexualize that six-year-old or that nine-year-old or that 11-year-old who's coming into her womanhood. That's not the child's responsibility. Yeah, that's an awesome point. And I think even as a father, I'm realizing that in this scenario, there's the concern of the man who is sexualizing my daughter with his eyes, and then there is my daughter. And I think to myself, in this scenario, which one can I do something about? I can't change that man and his sick thinking or even, you know, the possibility of his sick thinking, but I can remove my daughter from that scenario. But again, like you mentioned, there may be a psychological aspect to that solution that may be causing another problem that I didn't even realize. Can I say one more thing about that? Of to course. New York. Okay. So here is where, so we teach in that moment, you teach your baby. Yes. That so say, for example, you're not there and she has an encounter with that man that you were protecting her from. And he says to your, if you tell, I'm gonna or that the next scenario that follows behind silence and secrecy. Right. We're mm -hmm. already being invisibilized. We're already being erased in so many ways. She is more likely to Teresa's point, feel not believed. Because now she has said, if 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 I go out here and he does something to me, it's my fault. Oh wow, wow! If so, I if so, I don't, if I don't stay in my room and hide myself, so he won't be whatever it is that that he is doing. At some mm -hmm. point, we begin to internalize all of this outward stuff that has nothing to do with us. We take it upon ourselves. That's why many women don't tell the secrets. Mm. We're training so, at a very early age. It's our responsibility to protect men from our bodies or to give ourselves to it. And it, it need to be all right. Cause that's just the way of the world. Wow. Wow. I'd love to hear from some of our other panelists as well. Again, we're talking about what is it that we need to be protected from and who is it that should be doing the protecting? Mm -hmm. So, Tian, something you said I thought um, was interesting. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay. Um, you were saying, okay, who can I control? How can I control the situation? You know, I can control my daughter by telling her to go get dressed or go to the room, but I cannot control the thoughts of this grown man. And I think that one of the things that we need to consider when, when we're talking about who are we protecting Black women, is, women from you can't do anything maybe about a grown man um, other than maybe have some try to, like healthy conversations about, you know, right. the, that he might be having. But you can train up young men to respect women. And so, yeah. you know, let, let's I think we should start by training them and letting them know that they are in control of their bodies. We too often act like men are not in control of their body. You know, I tease you guys all the time when I'm with I, I say the fellas, right? Whatever, yeah. whenever we're talking about the subject, I go, y'all are the weaker vessel. You guys are the weaker vessel. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, how, how do we just excuse men and act like they don't have control? You know, we've got to wear our skirts to our ankle because you don't have control. You know, it's like, come on, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, come on um, with it. We need to start to train up our young men to let them know they are, in fact, in control of their own bodies. Yeah. And so let's start there with protecting our young women is how we train up our young men. Excellent, excellent point. And even to your point and to the point of Sharla who was speaking earlier, uh, what I thought to myself, and again, thank you so much for this conversation. These are the types of conversations that we need to have in the community so that from the start, we can start doing better things. I thought to myself as a father, you know, interesting that our first thought is to remove our daughter as though she were the problem in the variable, the problem variable, rather than saying, I won't allow someone in my house 
that I think has the potential to put my daughter in that scenario. See, so, so rather than not let your boy come over, you'd rather send your daughter away. And even as a man, that didn't hit me until just this moment. So I'm already so grateful for this conversation in that the idea of protecting our young Black women may start with not treating them like they're the problem variable. And recognizing that if you've got someone coming into your house, here you are the father and you have a daughter and it is your job at this point to protect your daughter, not just from outside influences, but from the way you make her see herself. Thank you very much. That was absolutely powerful. Sharice, we'd love to hear from you on this topic as well. Mm -hmm. You've been very calmly hanging out in the cut, <laughs> giving us those awesome nods, making me as yeah. a, a man in a room full of women is, I feel like I'm doing something right. Come on, <laughs> You're doing something right. right. You're doing something <laughs> right. Um, you know, for me, I, I definitely think about the impact of, you know, the elephant in the room, white supremacy. You know, mm -hmm. the you know, what what the impact of structural violence, the impact of uh folks continuing to try and uh force black women to measure within this proximity to whiteness, especially, especially white womanness. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're good, you know, we're good. <laughs> we got everything that we, that we need. We have all of the, uh, the elements uh, from the divine. You know, we don't, you know, we, when I think about even, you know, what Sherilyn and Reverend Harris have lifted up uh, and thinking about the ways that, you know, we have um, pretty much always had to navigate violence, you know, and harm uh, from from the moment we we come into this world, right? Uh, until the moment that we leave this world, whether it be on the family level, whether it be on the community level, whether it's in our churches, whether it's on our jobs, right? Um, definitely in the media, um, you know, definitely in, in um, you know, in, in these, you know, places and spaces where our leadership uh, is clearly necessary, but but often shunned because of how powerful it is, uh, how divine, how sacred it is, you know, how uh, discerning it is, how no BS it is, <laughs> uh, you know, that, and, and that we're all of these things, right? So when I think about, you know, so the who's and the what's, I mean, I think that we've all had our, I'm sure that if we had enough time to talk about the ways that we have been harmed. I mean, I have my own horror stories from my early childhood. Uh, you know, first time I, I ever experienced an act of, act of sexual violence, I was five, right? Oh, I'm 46. Wow. That means, you know, that that for, you know, 41 years, I have been navigating sexual harm, right? And so that's not, I'm not an anomaly at all, you know, and what that means for uh, for a black girl, what that means for a child, what that means, uh, you know, regardless of race or, or gender or, or sexual orientation, you know, it definitely sets in motion um, uh, a, a very rough terrain and unbalanced terrain for that child to, to navigate. And then, you know, coming into their adulthood, if they make it to their adulthood, how they navigate their adulthood. And so, you know, something that I think that we are all passionate about and thinking about the ways that a little girl needs to be protected and how some of those initial harms, uh, you know, potentially whether or not we, it seems like we were kind of moving towards a conversation around kind of like rape culture a little bit, uh, but, but how that evolves into how she handles herself as a as a grown woman. One of the things that uh, that I say when I'm when I'm talking about Black women's bodies, especially concerning like our reproductive and sexual health, is that we have intergenerational sexual health ignorance, and that also is is informed definitely by intergenerational uh, sexual assault and violence. Right, and wow. that for me, and and that is you know whether or not we're talking about slavery or if we talk about you know being even on the continent in in the motherland and and different customs you know where we might be sodomized uh you know or if it is uh it, i mean it just doesn't matter you know that we've had to we've been navigating some level of sexual harm or control 
right, since we got into this world. And, um, you know, and it is there that for me, you know, where I have to start to kind of unpack the work that we do and unpack the harm that that I not only have experienced, but many of the uh, women and girls, boys and men uh, and families that we that we serve at Sister Reach, um, you know, have also endured so much of the same type of violence. Wow. I mean, so many powerful things you just touched on. And, and one of the things that has that has and what you were saying that has always stood out to me. I've had the privilege and the opportunity to work in youth groups, youth organizations, youth ministries. I do youth youth uh, conferences and all kinds of things like that. And it 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 never ceases to amaze me the number of young girls that come through this these groups and these ministries that are 12, 13, 14, 15, and have been sexually assaulted. And on this topic of the unprotected black woman, what's hurting me, even on this subsection of this first question that we're asking, what has, what has bothered me deeply more than anything else was the description of the abuser. That in this time frame where we're talking about Black Lives Matter, in this time frame where we are talking about how others are treating us, what bothers me is that the abuser of each of these individuals, these young Black women, was a Black man. In our own community, abusing our own children. And so the amount of pain and emotional trauma that has now been inflicted on that, that girl. So now she is required to go out into, the, into this world. And from a community standpoint, we there are many people in our community that put a lot of distrust in the, in the, in the fairer skinned human beings. And then, so there's distrust of the white people, but her own life has taught her to distrust black men. So where does she go? And then how is she able to bloom and prosper from there? Again, that that's, I think firmly within this first question, who do we protect her from? It hurts that sometimes black women have to be protected from the black men who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing in the community instead of being protectors. They are the aggressors and abusers. But again, all of that is still wound up into this big ball of structural violence against our full communities, right? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm very clear that the, 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 the molested molest. You know what yeah. I mean? I'm very clear that the that young people who saw their mama get the hell beat out of them, right, can turn around and be that same abuser. I, you know, it was very it was very interesting, and I say that as a as the mother of a black male child, right, right. because it's my responsibility to try to teach him something different, uh, to try to give him an opportunity to. Um, to move through the world a little differently than than I've seen, you know, other males, sometimes right. males in my family or whatever. But I don't I don't want to just leave it at the feet of, of black men either and, and of black boys, you know, that this is a this is a, a family problem, right? Yeah. You know, that, you know, this isn't just men abusing women, this is also women abusing women and girls wow. abusing, and so that we have to we we we're, we got some issues that we really gotta combat. Yeah. Uh, and so when I say we have that intergenerational issue going on there, that kind of continuation of violence and harm, um, you know, a lot of it is us really not wanting to kind of turn internally and figure out how we really deal with uh, deal with that harm, which means we got to tell on uncle, we might have to tell on daddy, we might have to tell on auntie, you know, right, you right. know, and we may have to we may have to go ahead and address some things that that in some instances may incriminate ourselves. See, that's wow. the, the other part of it. Right. You got the abuser and then you might be the abuser. Wow. Right. And so, you know, for for the work that we do, it's it's multi layered. Um, yeah. and, and I've just I've just grown to have a certain level of compassion. I'm going to say I had to grow there. I wasn't okay. always there. Right. But I've had to grow to kind of make this more of a family type of center type of issue that that we're trying to combat versus just focusing on this kind of, you know, male female dynamic that that leaves way too many folks uh, who are responsible out of the conversation. Uh, so, yes, yeah, sexual violence for sure, uh, as well as it, right as it, what's been lifted up here, uh, verbal abuse from from others, verbal abuse. I, I mean, even. 
I mean, I can go on and on. You know, it's it's even bigger than sexual violence. It is uh, uh, body shaming. It is, wow. you know, there's so many. There, it is hair shaming. It is colorism. It is so wow. many issues that are, you know, ultimately, I feel like there is a an underlying kind of culprit there, and that culprit still is landing me more towards the kind of negative impacts of whiteness on our communities and and you know and us not having a better way of uh, a more natural and restorative way and implementing the more natural and restorative ways that i feel like we move culturally uh versus a very punitive cancel yeah. culture dynamic yeah. that does not allow for the exposure of the harmer to also be the redeemed right and to be the one who can uh you know can help to heal another person Right, because everybody's having a, a comprehensive conversation about where the violence started. My goodness, incredibly powerful insights. Really appreciate that. I want to transition a little bit to another question that we have that I think might be a little interesting. Um, we talked about a lot of these different dynamics that as a Black woman, you have to navigate in this world, um, everything that you just mentioned. So let me, let me ask you something, a little bit humorous, but not so much because I, I actually mean this. Um, does tonight's topic, the unprotected black woman and all the things that come along with it, do you believe that this has any connection to the angry black woman stereotype? Anybody want to jump in on that? I mean, we hear it all the time, right? The whole angry black woman, right? So when you talk about all that a black woman has to face, these obstacles that you just mentioned, just, just being a black woman. Does this stuff play into the angry black woman stereotype? Sherilyn, I see you're, you're ready to talk on this one. So I have, I have for a long time pushed so hard against this, but I, at this point I embrace it because I got a million reasons to be angry. And I actually want to elevate that word a little bit. I am enraged. Woo. I am enraged. I am enraged most of the time because here's what I realize. No matter what I do, it's that damned if you do and damned if you don't. When I try to be kind and complicit and go along and get along for the same reason black bodies are murdered in the street, we comply all day long and they murder us anyway. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I take the posture at this point. I'm going to stand in my right to be angry. I want to be table turning Jesus today, right? <laughs> I want to be all right with that part of myself. I have a right to be angry when there is subject matter that is so heavy, burdensome. And, and again, these egregious acts against my body, my presence, my voice, I have a right to be angry and I don't even defend it no more. I'd be like, yeah, yeah. So now yeah. let's talk about why I'm angry. Wow. I'm not going to go somewhere and sit because being, you know, it's kind of like um, what uh, Nicole brought up. So being black is not an insult. Oh, black thing. Yes. Clap for me. Being a woman. Oh, woman. Yes. Clap for me. Right. I get the opportunity to wake up with a vagina in the morning and call myself a woman. I get, I get <laughs> Come the privilege. On, Come through, Charlotte. I'm just talking about my position on womanhood. There are other kinds of women. There are trans women. There are, I get the opportunity to wake up with all of the things that I call myself a woman with that identify me as a woman. And I don't have to be afraid or ashamed. And if somebody wants to mislabel everything I say, as impassioned and as me trying to make space for myself in a world that has tried to silence me since birth, if they want to call me angry, yes, come here with that angry black woman. I'm all right with it at this point because I can't defend myself. I cannot defend myself from this raging diatribe of all of this. They, they, every defense I got, they got something else to say about it. Yeah, Every awesome. Woman. Awesome. And even an amazing comment coming from the comment section. Black women don't have enough spaces to express ourselves in a healthy way. Everything we do is criticized. We can't speak loudly in a country that was never meant to hear us anyway. You said Woo! that, Shalia. Come through, baby. Yeah. Shalia, I'm yes. Through. yes. 
And that's the issue. That's why at this point, I'm like, yes, angry black woman, actually enraged black woman over here. Call it what it is. Mm. Nicole, I noticed uh, you wanted yeah. to jump in. You had something. Cheryl, I've been making that ugly church face. You know, somebody right, you just like, <laughs> yeah. When they say something good, you want to be like, mm. yeah, yeah. No, and so I think that a part of why it's labeled as angry is because there's fear of our strength. Um, once the angry black woman decides to channel her energy into some action, you get what happened in Georgia. That's what happens. That's what happens is wow. that we decide that now, okay, yep, they don't piss me off. Now I'm going to act. <laughs> you know, so, and it's a fear, I think, of our strength. And so, yeah, I don't, you know, it, it doesn't bother me. If you want to call me angry black woman or, or whatever, whatever. <laughs> it's fine. That's how you feel. Um, let me channel this anger in a direction that's going to get you to hear me. And I think that um, that's mostly what, what we find ourselves doing is, you know, fighting to be heard. Um, but we're realized, you know, we, we do come to the point um, kind of think. So when we do decide that we're now going to act upon this anger, Right, mm. fear of black, an uh, angry black woman. Once she gets silent and start writing her plans down, okay. Long as I'm screaming and hollering, you probably in a safe position. But once I get quiet and start writing these plans down, that <laughs> means my anger is now going to go into action. And wow. watch out, everybody that's in my way. So if I'm yelling, you might as, you should be a little happy. But when I get quiet, you should get a little scared. And so that's that. But that's how I feel about it because I know you know from seeing how we organize, seeing how well we, we put things together. I mean, even with this last election, oh God, that was, listen, that was a whole bunch of angry black women. I said, how many, how many times must black women save democracy? I mean, come on, how many times must we do it? You know, <laughs> but we decided to put, to channel our energy into change. So I don't think it's a problem. I honestly don't think it's a problem. I think it's just that initial response and then we act and so. That's how it goes. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I know a lot of times we kind of get that angry black woman trope or stereotype. You you see her angry in the store or you say the wrong thing and it's like, oops, she's about to blow us up now. You better watch out. Um, but again, with how could you not imagine yourself being in a scenario where I've heard you say multiple times you feel unheard, uh, I don't feel valued, don't feel appreciated, despite all that you do, how much of history and household and community lays on the back of the black woman and still she feels unheard and not valued and not appreciated. Sharice? I love the comments so far. I'm, I'm gonna shake it up a little bit and say, uh, I think that the, you know, it's just a poor word choice. It's not that mm. we're angry, it's that we're powerful, right? And what folks can't take is the powerful black woman. Ooh. You know, what, what folks can't handle is the black woman who can say what she needs to say without talking around the mulberry bush about it, but directly tell you to sit down somewhere. You know, <laughs> um, you know, and, and I and I think that, you know, again, this kind of I'm gonna go back to that that pro, that that kind of weird wanting that proximity to to this white womanness, right? Is not who I am, <laughs> you know, uh, and and I think that, um, I mean, I, I got a big voice because I'm a singer as well. I, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm a, uh, I'm expressive, you know, uh, and so a lot of times my body language, the volume of my voice has been taken as me being angry when I know that I was trying to be, you know, as even toned and clear and direct. And what I realized is, is, you know, me trying to um, manage other people's assumptions of my attitude is not my mm. issue, it's not my problem. Uh, but for me to kind of counter that with, I think that what the real issue is, is that you prefer for me to be weak, that you will prefer for your, you, you would prefer to be able to walk over me. You would prefer 
you know, for me to not know my stuff, right? For me to not understand my work or not understand the 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 power that I bring into this conversation that you would you would expect me not to recognize that when I walked into this room, the energy in the room shifted, right? Mm. And I can't help because you can't handle power, right? Real power, not you know, transactional power, not uh, uh, cowardly power, not that not that mess that we saw on January the sixth, right? That was that was cowardice. That wasn't power, right? right. That was that right. was anger, you know. Uh, for what I have no idea, because you know the, the the environment in which they are pissed about is the environment in which they created, right? And so. You know, so so I think so. Then let, now let me reclaim. Let me take that word back and say now when we talk about me being angry, it's about the fact that we can't seem to hold power at the same time, right? Uh, I'm mm. angry that, that there is an expectation that I've got to be the weaker vessel. That there is an expect whether we're talking about a relationship with with partner, with wife, with husband, uh, with with management, with whom you know, and with legislators, with police. It doesn't, you know, the the the, you know, with any male in the room, right? Uh, the the idea is that I'm supposed to fall back versus the energy needing to shift to bring me and bring you <laughs> up to where we are, to where we could be together, right? And that that place is is the place where we can kind of tackle whatever the issue could could possibly be. So I don't, you know, I don't necessarily hold on to that angry black woman thing because people use it a little bit too. Too uh, frequently, and especially yeah. it has been yeah. used, tried, you know, used and hurled at me to try to silence and shame me and shut me down. And I'm saying, no, you know, what you just can't, you know. I love that with Beyonce uh, song on the on Black is King album, Power. You know, never will take my power, right? You know, they, you know, just that whole powerful. What does it mean to be able to deal with somebody who is not only your equal, but may have transcended you? You know, mm. and in a lot of kind of exchanges that I'm in, especially exchanges with, uh, you know, folks who may have more organizational infrastructure than, than we have or uh, folks who might come to the conversation with more credential or education than we have or I have um, or, uh, you know, folks who might have more resources than we have. It still doesn't mean that they are the most powerful player in the conversation. And just because I'm responding to that doesn't just automatically make me angry. Right. Uh, so, yeah. you know, so I just, that's kind of my thoughts. I was like, I'm gonna shake it up a little bit. Just to say, like, <laughs> I'm going to take that word. You know what I mean? Like, I just really want to take that word and make them eat that in a different kind of way. No, you can't deal with the power part. And let's just go ahead and deal with the fact that, you know, that we are we walk it. We live in the world many times, even with our men that, you know, our the thing that's always been the thing that killed me about, you know, uh, de dealing in relationships with that dynamic. What is it? What is it that draw you to you know drew you to me? Mm. It wasn't weakness, you know what I'm saying. It wasn't anger. It was the strength part. It was the power, right. right? So it's so interesting that once we come with that energy, that when folks don't you know when it's in inconvenient for them, all of a sudden it's our anger. It's not anger. Wow. That's not what that is. So you know that's a you know I know y'all like she ain't gonna be. I, I had to just no shake no it up no that is amazing. I had to shake it up. Her hair. I had to shake it up. <laughs> I love it. What an awesome transition, Nicole. No, I wanted to also say that um, that yes, what was this Scott saying is true. I think it's also the anger. The word anger is how someone else defines you, how they look at you. Wow. So I think, we, and I think we all understand that. Like that, that's what you're saying about me. But most of the time, how a person defines you is based on how you made that person feel. So if you made them intimidated, then anger, then, then now I'm the angry black woman, if what you felt was intimidation. So, and that's, that's in all, you know, a lot of different areas, you know, if you make me feel, you know, scared, if you, however you make, if you make me feel scared, then you are the, the villain, whatever. But so they, so the whole angry thing, that's a title that is given to us by the person who is trying to define us. And we know that. That's awesome. I mean, I, I, I'm loving this and I'm glad we brought this question up because again, we do hear this trope, this stereotype, the angry black woman, but I hope now that we can dismantle that and really understand that. First of all, you call a black woman angry. That's really a reflection on you, not her. That's you saying that you can't handle the power you just saw 
And what you're trying to do now is you're trying to tear down at her character because you can't handle the position that she's taking. You're using the word angry as a way to try to tear her down because you don't like her being that far up. But I love it. I love that this conversation has had an opportunity. You know, it's funny when Sharice was speaking, um, I was thinking about this movie called 300. I don't know if you've seen it, the Spartans going through. And I thought about the movie 300. And at one point that messenger came in, he said, control your woman. He said, this is Sparta. <laughs> Our Spartan women, you'll control Spartan women. Yeah, that's one of my favorite parts. Yes. Yes. Oh, this is Sparta. Sparta. Oh, my favorite part. <laughs> They said, no, no, no. This ain't your typical white society. These are black women. We don't control these women. Are you crazy? See, y'all, I, 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 I just want to say to why I say, yes, let's go with angry. My whole life, people have come. I'm, all I do is what Cherie said. You walk in the room, the energy shifts, and the only thing that's different is your presence. And people would say stuff like men and women, but mostly it's us. She thinks she, she, th and whatever the, the behind that ellipse, right? Uh -huh. I fought that battle my whole life. And so instead of rejecting it, I then said, you know, I am. I am that too. Like I am, she thinks she's smart. Yes, I am. Uh, she thinks she's fine. Yes, I am. Uh, she thinks she all that. Yes, I am. And yes, I, I am angry and I have a right to be about some things, but you're not going to diminish me with these words because that's what you came to do. Right. I'm going to, as Sharice said, I'm going to take them from you. I'm going to ball them up and create fire and snatch it all back. I'm going to send it back to you in a way that you weren't expecting. Come on, somebody, man. I know we saying some powerful things in here tonight. I can see from the comments, we're really helping some people, encouraging some people. That's exactly what I was hoping for. We're going to go into the final stretch here. Um, we did talk about some issues. I don't ever want to uh, talk about issues and bring up <laughs> issues without even attempting to talk about solutions. So how do we begin as an internal conversation? This is us talking to us. Our organization is the Centers for Black Excellence. We are ready to take this thing up to the next level in 2021 and beyond. So with a conversation amongst us, how do we begin to tackle this issue of the unprotected black woman within our homes and communities? Come on, somebody, take us out. Um, I think for me, you know, I think that we've lifted up a couple things. There's so much more that we could have said. I know we have a short time to to speak to uh, to some of these issues, but I think you know, just kind of if I bring back the, the work that I do in, in reproductive and sexual health, um, it definitely is is a, an amazing opportunity um, to talk about our bodies, to talk about uh, the ways that we understand ourselves, understand you know. Um, relationships understand one another that that like right now more than any time i think is just imperative for us to really be thinking about how we can have um more productive and healing conversations about you know the ruptures of uh of our those old family secrets that we don't want to talk about those things mm. that continue to plague us the stuff that you know uh you know we we when mama would say uh, you know, don't go outside this house talking about what's going on inside this house. Um, but what that has meant, you know, historically for our communities yeah. has has meant that we've been silent about very important issues and situations that have happened in our families. And I think that uh, we we then take a lot of that brokenness into our into our community, into how we deal with one another, you know, professionally, uh, in friendship. Um, work relationships how we you know how we deal with one another in the world and i and so I, I do think that in order for us to heal um you know we're we're gonna have to to address some of that but a lot of that is um you know we're gonna have to forgive too you know we're gonna have to forgive our mamas we're gonna have to forgive our fathers we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to forgive and i know that means we got to have some conversation and don't want to push us beyond the harm before we deal with the forgiveness but I think that if the, the the end result is that we're trying to figure out ways to forgive one another um, and heal forward, then we we might be able to, you know, 
grab a hold of some of these these other issues. I think that when you know when our backs are up against the wall, I think that we know instinctively how to react and how to how to move. We we moved as a community of black people to the polls to save our own lives, to protect our futures and, and for ourselves and for our children. Uh, and so okay, so now we got what we asked for. Now how will we steward what we have? How will we you know tend to the to this you know opportunity that we have uh, and some of that is going to really require, you know, us doing some homework, us doing some some back work, uh, you know, and trying to really deal with some of those mm -hmm. issues. I, I want to see more positive relationships between black men and black women. You know, I want my brother to know that I am not here. I'm not his. Com I'm not trying to compete. You know that that it is not my my objective to silence him or invisibilize him. Uh, but that I think that we both have to acknowledge that we've both been harmed, that we both are fighting to survive and keep our head, our heads above water. Uh, that sometimes that means sometimes intentionally and or unintentionally we've stepped on one another to do that, uh, you know, and that we we have a, a opportunity now to try to correct some of that, even with black women, you know, that you know had a really cool conversation with a sister who we've had a rupture in the past and today we had a, a moment to talk like hey girl you good i'm good we good we good okay cool <laughs> you work you know what i'm saying because sometimes we've got to be able to have those types of conversations it's going to be hard conversations they're imperative they're necessary right but they are they can be restorative uh, and even if you realize at the end of that, that you don't really want to fool with whomever that is at the end within our community, at least we know that we've at least addressed the issue, we've agreed to disagree, we've agreed of a, a way of how we handle each other and we try to move forward. Uh, our, 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 our communities depend on us addressing some of these past ills. Wow. Uh, and it's so, so many, but I hope that we can do that. Wow. Awesome insight. Nicole, Sharon, did you guys want to jump in on that? Uh, how do we begin to tackle this? Uh, so we can, we can, you know, how do we approach this issue that we've been discussing today, both either in the community or in the home, uh, before we move into our closing statements tonight? Well, I'll say, you know, one of the, the as a coach, you know, my primary hope for every individual in every room across the world, but especially those who look like me, is that we will be responsible for ourselves and seek the supports that we need um, with, after having been harmed. Because I don't necessarily buy into this hurt people, hurt people. I've been hurt, but I have tried my best not to do harm to others or hurt others because I knew I needed to take care of myself. So mm -hmm. I will say unaddressed issues, people carrying that heaviness and that burden around are just a time bomb ticking, waiting to go off in some space somewhere. So I would encourage us to address our issues, men and women. You hear a lot of times on, the, you know, whether it's the red table talk or Ayala or wherever folks end up sharing their shame and talking about what has harmed them. It's on the other side of that that they say, I realized. So accepting responsibility, dealing with our things that have uh, shaped us in ways that are malformed and don't they don't serve us, right? Um, take, there is some culpability that we have in these situations uh, after the harm has been done. You know what I mean? So I would say that's the first thing. Um, the, the other thing I would say is be discerning. So even Sharice and I had a conversation about what it means to trust Black women if Black women are doing the harm, right? Mm. So we want to also be able to trust people, but discerning when you cannot and when that relationship cannot be brought forward. Um, you know, we have a narcissistic president and I hate to say this, but just like Ju uh, uh, Judas went to hell, there's probably no place else for Trump. He's probably not redeemable. And I will say that we have to be able to discern when we've done all we can do in that realm of forgiveness and restoration and all of these things so that we don't go to hell with them. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is you're holding on so tight that if they fall off the cliff, you fall in too. Let them go. Yeah. Let them be who it is they need to be because there are so many examples 
of the unredeemable. And even the Bible says not all will be saved. And so I think when we can wrap our minds around what does it mean to forgive wow. and release and even, you know, consequences, prodigal, prodigal son outcomes, there's going to be some loss in between, right? Wow. All of these kinds of things, we have to be honest. And that's what I think we're not doing. So be discerning, be honest about our own culpability and be honest about what we can change. As you said, what is within your capacity? And sometimes we're looking at the wrong thing. It's not the daughter, it's the homies. <laughs> Have a conversation that is beyond the double standard of boys will be boys and men will be men. They don't say that about girls. Right. Ain't no grace or space for us to just be who we are. Oh, no. And so having men in the church even say, you know, you guard your eyes. That's not our job. My skirt is not the problem. It's your eyes that's the problem. Mm. Let's start there. Look away. You ain't got to look. <laughs> Unless I got you handcuffed to the uh, to the podium. <laughs> but a few. It ain't no reason you got to be in proximity to my good looks. <laughs> ain't no reason. That's some good stuff. And I can tell you <laughs> doing some good work over there at Peyton Place. Um, you know, even by the comments that's right here, you're a black woman ness. She's using Thank you, Shalia. Uh, I'm here for it. I'm absolutely incredible. Uh, Reverend Nicole, did you want to talk jump on that? Just this closing thought, how do we begin to tackle this internal issue within our community? Um, I'm going to start by placing some of it on us being, you know, self-care is important. <laughs> and so take care of yourself. And if you learn to treat yourself uh, the way that you should be treated, um, you're less susceptible to people treating you how you don't want to be treated. Um, and as a pastor of a predominantly black church, I have so many, and not, not even from just being in the church most of my life, I have had examples of black women who took care of everybody but themselves. That was an example mm. that I had. So now I'm a grown woman trying to realize how to change that for myself. Going, no, Nicole, you got to take care of you because if you can't take care of you, you can't take care of other people. And so um, it is okay to take care of you. Um, it is okay to go to church and have a therapist. Please do that, okay? Because it is okay to take care of you. Um, so protect yourself. Start with protecting yourself from yourself. And then it put you in a position to better protect yourself from others, I think. Um, and then also um, listen to Black women. Mm. Um, I think about, it bothers me sometimes that certain, some things are not heard until a white face says it or a man says wow. it. Um, I think about the um, the Me Too movement, right? Which I don't technically have anything against the Me Too movement, but I know that a black woman said Me Too first, and then it wouldn't really hurt until a white woman said it. Wow, that's, that's facts. So you know, it's lots of times where we're saying things and we're not being heard until someone else's face is painted on it. So um, you know, I would say for the whole community, please listen to us. That's powerful. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this conversation. I think it was amazing. We covered so many topics, gave such good advice and insight. Uh, what I find amazing is that each one of you guys are actually part of your own uh, organizations and you kind of do your own work. So before we end the stream tonight, I want to give space for each one of you to talk about the organizations that you are a part of and the work that you are doing. One of the things that we aim to do here, one of our initiatives at the Centers for Black Excellence is to support the work of black nonprofits that are supporting the black community. And so I definitely wanna take a moment to do that. Uh, let's start with our sister Cherie Scott at Sister Reach. Would you tell us a little bit more about your organization um, and, and you know just kind of give us some insight there? Absolutely. So uh, Sister Reach is a reproductive justice organization in Tennessee. And the reproductive justice uh, framework was coined by 12 Black women in 94 to center our lived experiences around the issues of our reproductive and sexual health. Um, some of the work that we're doing in our communities is working with young people and making sure that they know about their bodies and as well as working with their parents 
Uh, we are working with our faith community, uh, educating them on public policies that are impacting not only the folks who are in the in the community, but folks who are in the pews. Uh, we are um, trying to um, continue to educate legislators on policies that they craft that impact our communities in, in harmful ways and multi-layer ways, not just black folks, uh, but folks of color, uh, uh, queer people, um, poor white folks, and, and because we're in a state where as the only kind of official, uh, if you will, reproductive justice organization, we find ourselves work, working across several demographics uh, toward the goal of trying to make sure that the lives of, of Black communities, uh, Black women and girls um, and, and folks are, uh, are also centered and that we kind of can move together uh, toward liberation and, and to achieve human rights. Um, but we're also uh, working to ensure that um, with our harm reduction work, making sure that folks have access to free HIV testing, uh, safe sex kits, uh, we're working with our um, uh, we're working very intentionally with queer women of color um, who don't have, you know, kind of any space or place to unpack some of the issues that they are dealing with in their reproductive and sexual health. So we're filling voids more than not. We've been filling voids now. We'll be 10 years old in October. Um, and we have just been trying to kind of put our hands on all of these different issues that center uh, reproductive oppression, uh, which is that, you know, exploiting our bodies, exploiting our labor, uh, you know, exploiting our abilities to be self-determining and uh, dishonoring our bodily autonomy and, and our ability to make sacred decisions about ourselves and our families and our communities. And so we ask that you support our, our work uh, at sisterreach.org. And that's uh, right there across the screen. Uh, there's opportunities to get involved. There's opportunities to donate. Um, there's opportunities to join us with the work that we're doing. We're working on our Black Folks Day on the Hill. Is, which is an annual event where we try to get as many Black folks who want to go with us in Tennessee um, and those who also, we also work in uh, five other states, Alabama, Kentucky, Mississippi, uh, and Arkansas. Uh, and we are also trying to make, make sure that those folks also have some type of a, um, if needed, uh, uh, organized response to talking with their legislators about issues that impact Black communities very specifically, using that reproductive justice lens as a way forward to help us really think about these intersectional issues, how they inform one another, um, how they exacerbate one another, and how it, they cause uh, sometimes grave disparities in, in our communities. And so we appreciate you and we appreciate the center for inviting us to be a part. I've enjoyed myself so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such incredible work you're doing at Sister Reach. I'm so glad we had an opportunity to allow more people to see exactly what you're doing. At this point, I want to go ahead and switch over to our sister, Cheryl and Peyton at Peyton Place Coaching. Could you just share with us a little bit more about your organization, what you're doing there, and how we can get involved? I sure will. So I am, of course, a life and business coach, but I practice a coaching model, community coaching, which is um, a collaborative leadership coaching model. And within that, one of the things that I really want to share out into the community is developing other coaches and making the world aware that coaches don't have to compete. They can collaborate in these ways where our community gets all of its needs met. So I do it through like an eco mapping model where what do I lack that another coach has where we can provide this wholeness of resources, you know, to our community. Uh, I also am a uh, licensed um, uh, standards of excellence consultant where I help develop nonprofits in more, again, the policies and practices and organizational development and mission development. And that is something that I've always been passionate about, even before I had a name for it, working with uh, minority and women-owned businesses. So I am living and breathing this uh, justice and equity and wanting to make an impact in these spaces by providing this kind of ongoing support. It is my lifestyle and it's my life. It's not just my business. My daughter will tell you, I've probably been coaching them since they came out of the cradle. <laughs> Um, she can't stand it, but she loves it at the same time. Uh, but it is truly in the core of my being to try to build my community. And as Cherie said earlier, on both sides, the harmed and those um, who have perpetuated harm 
in society through inequity. And so I want to make sure that we address that in um, honest ways. So that's what I do here at Payton Place Coaching. And um, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely incredible. Again, another awesome organization. We'll go on now to our Reverend Nicole D. Harris. If you could tell us a little bit about the work you're doing um, and the organizations that you're a part of. The organizations I'm a part of. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know there's a long list when it comes to you, but share what you would like to share with us about I'll what just, you're involved in and how we can how we can help. Okay, so I'm gonna just share two. Um, so I am um, the pastor of Dorgy Memorial Amy Zion Church in Schenectady, New York, um, and uh, that's our, our website dorgy.org. Uh, I am the proud pastor. Um, and we're doing a lot of great work in the city of Schenectady. I just got there about a year and a half ago, um, and I am proud to, to, to announce I am the president-elect for the NAACP uh, there in Schenectady. So um, I want to encourage anybody to find uh, the branch. You can go to the Facebook page, um, hoping that we get some people to sign up. It's a very strong branch, but I'm so uh, excited and humbled that they would trust this, this new pastor, womanist, uh, loud uh, <laughs> Nicole to, to lead the NAACP branch in Schenectady. So I'm um, looking forward to that work. Um, and I just want to take time. I do this from time to time. I want to just speak to um, a young lady who fellowships uh, with our church, Nyla Fulton. Um, if she is watching, I'm sure she'll watch this at some time. Uh, Nyla uh, is a teenager. Nyla is called to preach. Nyla, you are fabulous and wonderful just the way God made you. And in a space where people still debate over whether or not women should preach, I just want you to know that you are called to preach. Wow. So um, that is my word for, I'm going to close it with that, uh, giving encouragement to Nyla. Wow, absolutely awesome. Thank you to each one of our amazing panelists for being part of the discussion. I'm looking at the comments. It looked like people really enjoyed the discussion. They were able to get so much out of it. Coach Sherilyn Payton rocks. Come on now. I see y'all coming through in the comments. Uh, really fed their souls. So we're going to continue to have conversations like this. I invite you, if you enjoyed tonight's conversation, to join us every Tuesday night as we have these panel discussions talking about these important topics that we have to discuss in the Black community. It was said earlier tonight that it's part of our culture that we don't talk about what goes on in the house, but that's why all the stuff still goes on in the house. So it's important that we have these conversations and talk about it. I want to leave you tonight just telling you a little bit about our organization, the Centers for Black Excellence. We are focused on promoting unity, education, and the financial empowerment of the Black community. Our primary goal is actually to create the nation's largest monthly donor pool. And we are going to use the money in this pool to be able to support other nonprofits like some of the ones you saw on the stream tonight. We're also using the money from that pool in order to create what's called the Black Excellence Scholarship Fund, where we will be giving um, scholarships out to students. But most importantly, and our primary purpose for that fund is to create more Black homeowners in Black communities. We must start creating generational wealth through land ownership and property. Unfortunately, many Black communities are primarily renting communities, and we don't own where we live. But if we pool our funds together, we don't have to wait for anyone else to do for us what we can do for ourselves. We just need to do it together. You're welcome to join us at our website, the Centers for Black Excellence.org. If you're watching this on Facebook, you can see the website right up there at the top in our links. Thank you again for joining us for another great conversation again. Thank you to all of our panelists for taking the time out to be a part of this incredible panel discussion. Join us next week as we discuss on the topic, the power of unity in the black community. Come on, y'all. We're going to keep having these conversations. So join us next week right here on Facebook Live, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, since we had a couple of people on from Central Time. I'll definitely make sure I'm better at making sure I say that. So join us next week. We'll have another great discussion. Thank you so much. God bless you and have a great night.